chief national security correspondent, Jim Shudo. He's in Manila right now in the Philippines. He has an exclusive report on that confrontation between the Chinese military and a U.S. spy plane. Jim, tell our viewers what happened. Well, if it comes down to fundamental, potentially dangerous disagreement, though these islands are brand new, manufactured, in fact, China views them as sovereign territory. The U.S. views them as international waters, international airspace, and it demonstrates that, as it did today, by flying over them, sailing nearby them, Chinese protests getting louder, U.S. moves getting bolder, the tension there escalating. For a military aircraft, this is Chinese High above the South China Sea, the radio crackles with a stern warning. Go, go! A source of dispute appears on the horizon seemingly out of nowhere. Islands man-made by China, hundreds of miles from its coastline. So when's the last time you went up? CNN got exclusive access to classified U.S. surveillance flights over the islands. First time journalists have been allowed on an operational mission by the state of the art P 8A Poseidon, America's most advanced surveillance and sub hunting aircraft. So we've just arrived on station now above the three islands that are the targets of today's mission. It's these three islands that have been the focus of China's building in the South China Sea over recent years. China's alarming creation of entirely new territory in the South China Sea is one part of a broader military push that some fear is to challenge U.S. dominance in the region, sailing its first aircraft carrier, equipping its nuclear missiles with multiple warheads, developing missiles to destroy U.S. aircraft carriers, and now building military bases far from its shores. For the U.S., the islands are a step too far, and this flight is part of a new and bold American military response may soon include sailing U.S. warships close by as well. In just two years, China has expanded these islands by 2,000 acres, the equivalent of 1,500 football fields and counting, an engineering marvel in waters as deep as 300 feet. You're a military man. You look at this. Is there any doubt that that is a future military installation? It appears to be a buildup of military infrastructure, and not to mention we were just challenged uh, probably 30 minutes ago, and the challenge came from the uh, Chinese Navy, and I'm, I'm, I'm highly confident it came from a shore uh, on this facility here. Yeah. What used to be the Fiery Cross Reef now has early warning radar, an airport tower, and a runway long enough to handle every aircraft in the Chinese military. Some are calling it China's unsinkable aircraft carrier. These videos of the islands, taken from the P-8's advanced surveillance cameras, never before declassified. In a sign of just how valuable China views them, the new islands are already well protected. There's obviously a lot of surface traffic down there, um, Chinese warships and Chinese Coast Guard ships. We heard the proof. The Chinese Navy ordering the P-8 out of the airspace not once, not twice, but eight times on this mission. Uh, this is the Chinese Navy. This is the Chinese Navy. Please go away quickly. And like the surveillance videos, the audio of these warnings never before shared with the public. You heard over the intercom, Chinese Navy, this is the Chinese Navy. And what was interesting is that there were also civilian aircraft. There was a Delta flight on that same frequency that when it heard that challenge, it piped into the frequency to say, what's going on? Uh, the Chinese Navy then reassuring them. But as the flight crew tells me, that can be a very nerve-wracking experience for civilian aircraft in the area. And the more China builds, we're told, the more frequently and aggressively it warns away U.S. aircraft. This is a dredger actually pumping sand uh, from under the water uh, on top of an area they're trying to build up uh, land. And we see this every day. So I, don't, I think they work weekends when they're doing this. 24-7. Uh, it, it happens. Uh, we see it all the time. Looking at these islands, you see the landing strips, you see military barracks, you see roads being built, trucks driving on those roads, and squadrons of dredgers and cargo ships adding to them every day. I have to say, Wolf, as you see them, they look like very permanent installations. It's difficult to see how, even with increased U.S. military traffic in the area, how China backs down. Jim, why the increased concern about all of this right now? Because I know there is intense concern at the highest levels of the United States government. 
It's two things, Wolf. One, it is pace. Over the span of just two years, China has expanded the area of these islands from five acres to 2,000 acres, 400 times, and it's rising every day. We saw that today, but it is also this. It is the militarization of them, putting in landing craft that can carry the largest military aircraft in the Chinese arsenal, uh, the early warning radar systems, deep water harbors, harbors that can accommodate U.S., rather Chinese Navy ships. It is that militarization that has the U.S. now considering a bolder military response. And when the Chinese military says to the American Poseidon, the crew up there, please go away quickly, what's the reaction from the crew inside that Poseidon uh, surveillance plane? Well, they recite, recite very calmly a script. They say that we see these as international waters, international airspace, and that the U.S. will continue peacefully. And I'll tell you, there was one instance there that when that American pilot delivered that message, I heard the frustration from the Chinese radio operator on the ground coming, coming back simply saying, go, go, go away. You can hear the anger there. It's hard to see how this temp tension doesn't escalate going forward. Jim Shudo with an exclusive report for us. Thanks very much. Uh, we're going to get reaction to that. That's coming. A new, blatant, and aggressive threat from Kim Jong-un. His forces will open fire on any South Korean ships moving into what he sees as North Korean waters. Tonight, South Korea, a U.S. ally, is angrily vowing retaliation. Threats like this from Pyongyang have kept America from being able to negotiate over Kim's nuclear weapons program, like it's trying to do with Iran. CNN has learned during the two years of America's obsessive attempts to prevent Iran from building even one nuclear bomb, North Korea has been greatly expanding its ability to make the, the nuclear explosive materials that it needs to make nuclear weapons. Former U.N. weapons inspector David Albright says in those two years, Kim Jong-un's regime has doubled the size of the enrichment plant at Yongbyon, which you can see in these satellite photos. Yongbyon is where experts say North Korea enriches uranium for nuclear bombs. And Albright says that's not all they've done. North Korea has been spending its own money to build up its nuclear weapons program, but it's also been shopping overseas to get the equipment that they need in order to build up their, their nuclear arsenal. Why hasn't the Obama administration pursued talks with Kim Jong-un's government as fervently as it has with Iran? White House and State Department officials tell CNN they're committed to drawing down Kim's nuclear weapons and are open to dialogue with Kim's government. But North Korea has to show a commitment, which it hasn't done yet. Analysts say there are other reasons. I think we have rapidly approached the point of no return over the past five years. This program has gained a lot of momentum over the past few years, and not much has been done to stop it. The result is ominous. Analysts say Kim's regime may well be able to fit nuclear warheads on missiles that can hit South Korea or Japan, and they're thought to be adding to their arsenal. North Korea could have... now the Kremlin has insisted that its annexation of Crimea in the middle of March last year was purely a reaction to a referendum that was staged there in which uh, apparently 97 percent of the population of Crimea voted to become part of Russia. Now that position has, has changed. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, on state television as part of a doc documentary uh, marking a year since Crimea became part of Russia saying that in fact this was part of uh, a pre-planned uh, plan uh, which, uh, which was discussed some weeks before the referendum took place. Take a listen. I called the leaders of the special services in the Ministry of Defense to the Kremlin and I laid the task out before them to save the life of the president of Ukraine. Otherwise they would have just destroyed him. We ready to take him straight out of Donetsk, by land, by sea and by air. It was the night of the 22nd to the 23rd. I said to all colleagues, 
we have to start working on the return of Crimea to Russia. Well, Vladimir Putin there revealing also details of a plan to evacuate Viktor Yanukovych, uh, the ousted president of Ukraine. Up until now, uh, there had been no details about a special forces operation that had been set in motion uh, to extract him. Um, it's not the first time, I have to say, that Vladimir Putin has, how shall we say, revised uh, his, uh, his idea, uh, revised what happened in the past, the steps that have been taken. Remember, uh, on February the 27th of last year, when uh, armed men dressed in full uniform uh, started to take over key government installations in Crimea. The word from the Kremlin back then was that these are not Russian forces. Uh, these are purely self-defense groups that have assembled uh, ad hoc on the ground. He then subsequently admitted that they were, in fact, Russian regular forces sent in to back the locals. Uh, and so, it, again, it's not the first time that Vladimir Putin has changed his story. And I suppose it raises the question, will he change his story again over other details? For instance, the deployment of Russian forces in, in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, which he categorically denies at the moment. Will that story change? And like the surveillance videos, the audio of these warnings never before shared with the public. You heard over the intercom, Chinese Navy, this is the Chinese Navy. And what was interesting is that there were also civilian aircraft. There was a Delta flight on that same frequency that when it heard that challenge, it piped into the frequency to say, what's going on? Uh, the Chinese Navy then reassuring them, but as the flight crew tells me, that can be a very nerve-wracking experience for civilian aircraft in the area. And the more China builds, we're told, the more frequently and aggressively it warns away U.S. aircraft. This is a dredger actually pumping sand uh, from under the water uh, on top of an area they're trying to build up uh, land. And we see this every day. So I don't, I think they were challenged uh, probably 30 minutes ago and the challenge came from uh, Chinese Navy, and I'm, I'm, I'm highly confident it came from a shore uh, on this facility here. Yeah. What used to be the Fiery Cross Reef now has early warning radar, an airport tower, and a runway long enough to handle every aircraft in the Chinese military. Some are calling it China's unsinkable aircraft carrier. These videos of the islands, taken from the P-8's advanced surveillance cameras, never before declassified. In a sign of just how valuable China views them, the new islands are already well protected. There's obviously a lot of surface traffic down there, um, Chinese warships and Chinese Coast Guard ships. We heard the proof. The Chinese Navy ordering the P-8 out of the airspace not once, not twice, but eight times on this mission. Uh, this One part of a broader military push that some fear is to challenge U.S. dominance in the region, sailing its first aircraft carrier equipping its nuclear missiles with multiple warheads, developing missiles to destroy U.S. aircraft carriers, and now building military bases far from its shores. For the U.S., the islands are a step too far, and this flight is part of a new and bold American military response that may soon include sailing U.S. warships close by as well. In just two years, China has expanded these islands by 2,000 acres, the equivalent of 1,500 football fields and counting an engineering marvel in waters as deep as 300 feet. You're a military man. You look at this. Is there any doubt that that is a future military installation? It appears to be a buildup of military infrastructure. And not to mention, we were... Great alert zone. Leave immediately. High above the South China Sea, the radio crackles with a stern warning. Go, go! The source of dispute appears on the horizon seemingly out of nowhere islands man-made by China hundreds of miles from its coastline. So when's the last time you went up? CNN got exclusive access to classified U.S. surveillance flights over the islands. Maybe not. Check. The first time journalists have been allowed on an operational mission by the state-of-the-art P-8A Poseidon, America's most advanced surveillance and sub-hunting aircraft. So we've just arrived on station now above the three islands that are the targets of today's mission. It's these three islands that have been the focus of China's building in the South China Sea over recent years. China's alarming creation of entirely new territory in the South China Sea is...
begin with our chief national security correspondent, Jim Shudo. He's in Manila right now in the Philippines. He has an exclusive report on that confrontation between the Chinese military and a U.S. spy plane. Jim, tell our viewers what happened. Well, if it comes down to a fundamental, potentially dangerous disagreement, though these islands are brand new, manufactured, in fact, China views them as sovereign territory. The U.S. views them as international waters, international airspace, and it demonstrates that, as it did today, by flying over them, sailing nearby them, Chinese protests getting louder, U.S. moves getting bolder, the tension there escalated. Foreign military aircraft. This is China.